Welcome everyone, Dylan Jamelli here today with a brand new video for you. So today we're going to talk about the worst steroids for estrogen conversion. But before we get into that, I want to reiterate that I am not a doctor. Anything I say in these videos is for your entertainment purposes only. I'm not insinuating nor advising you to use any of the things that we discuss and what you do with this information is completely and utterly up to you. So what we're going to do today is really focus in on the steroids that you need to be concerned about or aware of that convert to estrogen, all right? Um, one thing that I do want to point out here, Anadrol is not on this list because Anadrol does not, and I repeat, it does not convert to estrogen, all right? It is a DHT derivative, but you have to keep something in mind with Anadrol. It's non-aromatizing, as I said, but it's notorious for imposing some of the highest estrogenic effects on its users through basically currently unknown pathways. All right, there's theories. It's hypothesized that it is, or it's metabolites, I guess, act as an estrogen itself in various tissues. But, but, nobody truly knows why. And Tren, while it's not a DHT derivative, but due to its really unique chemical structure and modification, is completely unable to aromatize as well. So I want to clear that up before we even get into this list. All right, so what I'm going to do now is focus on the, the ones that you need to worry about or at least know and understand convert to estrogen. Okay, so I want to start with DECA. Now, there's a misconception with DECA. People think that it's got this high rate of aromatization and that you're going to hold a ton of water when you use it, which is not the case. All right, but DECA actually has a really low rate of aromatization, about 20% less than testosterone, um, if not more. So I just want to reiterate that DECA does convert to estrogen, but not nearly at the rate as that people do think that it does. One of the main reasons that people have a lot of water retention issues with DECA, for example, is because they're running their test far too high and they're also running their DECA far too high and they're not balancing out the, you know, the estradiol and prolactin levels. So when you stop balancing these out, when you start running major amounts of tests and things like that, well, test converts to estrogen too at a higher rate, clearly. So you've got to worry about all of these. You don't need massive amounts of test and DECA when you're running them, etc. Or what's going to happen is you're going to get a lot of estrogen and then you're probably going to blame it on DECA when in fact it's really because you're running too much test or not running the proper ancillaries along with it. So DECA is on the list of something that you need to be aware of. Um, and you're going to want to, you know, know that there's possibility of needing an aromatase inhibitor. All right. Number two is equipoise. All right. Now, equipoise possesses an aromatization rate of roughly half of testosterone. It's very, very low. It's not known for causing water retention. And most people really don't run into any estrogenic issues with equipoise whatsoever. All right. In fact, uh, people are going to notice it a lot more with anadrol. It doesn't even convert to estrogen. But it's something that you need to be aware of. It's a possibility. It's funny because most people use equipoise. They use it to stay drier or to cut. But you have to understand that the chances are there that you could have some estrogenic issues and it does actually convert to estrogen. All right. So number three, and, and I'm, I'm not doing this in order of what's worst, I guess, but number three on this list, clearly testosterone. We all know testosterone, well, most of us do, converts to estrogen at a pretty good clip. All right. Some people get away with running, say, 500 milligrams of test and not needing much of an aromatase inhibitor, but they're in the smaller class of people that get away with it. Generally speaking, more people are estrogen prone than aren't. All right. But it still doesn't take away from the fact that there's a lot of people that aren't estrogen prone. The key here is blood work. Pre-cycle, mid-cycle, post-cycle. Pre-cycle to get a baseline, mid-cycle to see how you're reacting, and post-cycle to see how you're recovering. That's how you determine what kind of an aromatase inhibitor you need. But test definitely converts at a really nice, really nice rate, and it's something that you need to be aware of. You don't need a gram of testosterone, okay? It's gonna convert to estrogen at a pretty good rate. All right, and, and that's gonna bring on issues, especially if you're running it with other estrogenic compounds. So you've got to be aware of testosterone and its estrogen conversion, and you've got to always have an aromatase inhibitor on hand. I don't care what you're running, you should always have one on hand, but you should definitely be using one at some rate. Not necessarily the highest rate, but at some rate. 
Then we've got D-ball. Now, D-ball, most people will think it's number one is the, the highest, you know, estrogen conversion, you know, out there for in terms of steroids. It's not. It's number two. I'll tell you why when we get to number one. But D-ball is known. What is the number one side effect known with D-ball? It's the, the possibility of getting gynecomastia and having estrogen side effects. D-ball converts at an extremely high rate. Most people that you talk to will always tell you, well, you're going to lose a lot of your gains because a lot of it's water weight, which in, in some sort of fashion, there is true. You don't have to lose all your gains with D-ball, but you're going to lose some because there is a lot of water. All right, so you've got to be aware of that. You've got to control your estrogen. All right, you don't need a ton of D-ball either. I always tell people, don't go over 30 milligrams a day. There's no point because you're getting so much out of it already. There's no need to press it to 40 and 50 milligrams because what happens when you go higher? You might think it's more is always better, but what happens when you go with more? You get more side effects, which causes you more problems, which results in less gains being retained. So D-ball is right there. It's, it's the second most, but number one is Trustalone, also known as menth. You're not going to run into anything that converts to estrogen at a higher rate than this. It, it is extreme on the estrogen conversion. I see a lot of people that have to do daily um, you know, doses of aromacin to even come close to controlling estrogen with, with Trustalone. It is brutal on estrogen, and a little bit of Trustalone goes a very long way. It's not a steroid for beginners either, but trust me when I tell you, I know the results are excellent with it. I know a lot of people like it, but it can cause a lot of problems and it is because of the estrogen conversion. So you have got to be aware of how high of rate that the estrogen conversion is with Trestalone and be in control of that from day one or it's going to bite you. It's going to bite you hard. So be aware, take care of yourself, protect yourself. And you can do and use these compounds successfully without having a lot of issues. But you've got to respect them and you've got to take control right away and prevent any sort of issues from occurring before they even start. You don't want to let things get out of hand and then catch them. It's good to be preventative at first. Don't be over preventative because you don't want to crush your estrogen either. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to crush your estrogen. That's the worst thing you can do too. You know, letting it get too far out of line or too low. Two terrible things. You don't want to do either one of them. All right? But keep control of it and start it from day one and protect yourself. So, Dylan Gemelli, signing off. <laughs>